Okay. Well, good morning. It's the 14th July, 2024, and we're together in the house of the Lord, and we're looking at um, the Song of Solomon. And I've got one, um, um, chapter 7, and it's on page 706 in the Church Bible. And uh, can we pray, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful, beautiful poem which speaks of the devotion of Christ and his bride, the Church. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the power of some of these words and the extent to which love is supreme. And we thank you that God is love. And this morning we want to hear about love. We want to know uh, what it is to be loved by you and to love you. And uh, I can't convey that, Lord, and I can't, you know, I can't do anything, but I ask that in your mercy you would go right past me and you would speak. So help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. We're on page 706, just to pick up that last thought, and I'm just going to read, I want to read verse 10 of chapter 7, but in chapter 8, so on the same page, uh, verse 6, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which have a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned. In other words, it would be treated with absolute contempt if you imagine that material things would buy or even equate to the wonder of God's love. And that's the title of my talk, God made you, God loves you. That's the title. I'm in verse 10 of chapter 7. And I was so grateful to God yesterday when he gave me this verse for myself. And it's a great thing when, you, when, when something comes off the page and into your heart. Because God is giving it to you. It's a great thing, isn't it, friends? But all scripture is breathed, God breathed. All the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. So we can all take what God has said as our own to possess for ourselves. But this verse is terrific. In verse 10, I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. What a fantastic truth that God loves us. God who made us loves us. And his desire is toward us. Now, I don't, there's a danger when we, when we go into that realm of the wonder of God's love and the loving nature of God, there's, there can be a danger of um, losing sight of his holiness and his majesty, his glory. And I, just moving on a few pages into Isaiah 6, I want to just look at one scripture which is so powerful. Uh, in regard to that thought, you know, that God is holy, majestic, glorious, beyond anything we can actually imagine. And I'm in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Isaiah, page 711. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, with two he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. What a vision! of the glory and holiness of God. And you've got these angels, seraphims are angels, and they're, they're constructed in a very interesting way, aren't they? Usually they've just got a pair of wings, if they have wings. We looked at it in the Bible study, I think, with the incredible variety of form that angels have. And um, without going back there, but if you look at Revelation 18, an angel came down whose glory lightened the earth. An angel, what a glorious being is that. But other angels are so like humans that 
We're told in Hebrews 13, be careful to entertain, entertain strangers because some people have entertained angels without even knowing that those visitors were angels. They're so like human beings. So there's a variety of form with the angels, but these are constructed in a certain way because they're holy, sinless, perfect, but they can't look at God. So there's an, if ever there was a picture in the scriptures of the greatness of God, remember when Moses said, show me your glory, no man can look at me and live. I'll hide you in a rock, I will go past you, you can look at the back of me. The glory of God, these angels, fabulous beings. So I want to just pick up that point and make it pretty firmly, and I'll be coming back to Isaiah 6 towards the end of this talk. But it's not surprising that the prophet Isaiah had to have this encounter with the holiness of God. King Isaiah had died, and I imagine that Isaiah was incredibly disappointed and probably had some huge questions because King Isaiah was a, a good king for 50 long years. 50 years. And then he slips. And the holiness of God removes him from office, gives him leprosy, and he dies in quarantine as a leper. After 50 years of terrific service of God and, and a great reign. And I think uh, probably Isaiah hoped that he would recover from his leprosy, might be even be restored and and, and he, he, as I needed to see again what God is really like. And so when you get that marvellous scripture that we, we read, I am my beloved, his desire is toward me, you've got to stay focused always on the holiness of God. Don't, don't get a, 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 which can do, a kind of wrong familiarity with the Lord because of his love. Now, I want to look at, Uzziah, that king, because there's such important lessons uh, in his life. And it's in 2 Chronicles and chapter 26. I'm going to give you the number in a sec. 2 Chronicles 26. So we're on page 507 in the Church Bible. And... I'm reading, I'll read verse 5, I'm going to pick out a few verses, I won't read the whole chapter, but picking out a few verses. Concerning this king, verse 4, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. He saw God, in, this is very significant, in the days of Zechariah, it's not the Zechariah, the restoration prophet, many years before that, well some years before that anyway. Um, but he saw God in the days of Zechariah. Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. What a significant statement that is, friends. It runs across time and eternity. What will make my life a success spiritually, maybe not materially, but spiritually, is taking hold of the God who made me, seeking his face, doing business with him, as opposed to all the other intervening issues and snares oftentimes. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I believe that for every Christian, seeking God is a way of life. And I think it has to be. As a matter of security, but apart from that, as a matter of taking hold of all that he has for us. You know, Paul says, I'm, I, I'm not, I, I haven't apprehended what I've been apprehended for, but this thing I'm doing, I'm pressing on. And you think, well, Paul, aren't you there? Well, he was there, wasn't he, in a mighty way, but he knows he's going to force his way forward to take hold of everything God has for him. And I think this is a very important truth, friends. Seek ye the Lord. And as long as he sought the Lord, everything was okay. And other issues from his life, verses 6 and 7, I'm in 2 Chronicles 26. Too. He went forth, he warred against the Philistines. That was good, wasn't he? 
the enemies he warred against, he fought them. And he broke down their defences, the wall of um, Jabna, the wall of Ashdod, those, those quite near Gaza, aren't they actually, those towns? Fortified towns broke down their walls, took away their defences. And God helped him, verse 7, for he's, he's a man who's seeking God. God helped him against the Philistines and the Arabians that dwelt in Gabal and the, and the Mahunins. And the Ammonites gave, they surrendered and tried to get into his favour. As long as he sought the Lord. And um, he, did, he, he fought. And we have got, we've got to fight, friends. It's a spiritual battle that we're in. And we have those weapons that God has given us. Weapons of our warfare. They're not natural, but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Prayer chiefly. A disciplined life where we focus on what God has required of us. And even if it's a bit costly, that's where we will pitch our tent. Um, prayer, the word of God. And I'm coming to something else in a minute. Um, and then... Um, in verse 10 of that, I'm still in the same, looking at lessons from Uzziah's life, um, verse 10 of chapter 26. Sorry. Yeah. Um, he built towers in the desert. He did many wells. He had much cattle. He was a great husbandman. But he built towers in the desert. And... Um, you know, it, it's such a good thing, isn't it, to not to wait till they're banging on the door at Jerusalem, but you can confront them there. You know, and there are so many things in our spiritual life that we've got to deal with, otherwise they will be like a, an incoming flood. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. And I'm picking up a bit loosely, but I think this is on target, picking up lessons from this great king, 50 long years a good rain. And um, I remember the um, dedication of the temple when you read about King Solomon, it might be 1 Kings 8, I think so, um, the dedication of the temple. And Solomon is praying against future contingencies, probably some of them generations ahead. If your people sin, if there's famine, if the enemy have got ground, then hear from heaven. Get them straight again. Defend them. Restore them. And I personally have found, and I'm sure you have too, that you can kind of store up a prayer, you know, against what might come. Not to be neurotic and expecting what may never happen, but prepared in prayer for what may come. And sometimes what you know is going to come. So he built his towers in the desert. He wasn't going to wait for the enemy to come to him. And um, it's a little bit like, you know, it's not exactly the same, but it's a little, little bit like that principle of um, when we know that the spirit is willing, we really mean well and we mean business, but the flesh is weak, we've got our weaknesses, and everything happens, doesn't it, to, let, to get those in the ascendancy. What's the answer? Well, you get that from the Lord in the garden, don't you? The spirit's willing, the flesh is weak, therefore watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, that you aren't led into a place where it's nigh on impossible to do what's right. Don't get there. Don't get there. Stay so, clo stay clo stay so close to the Lord, so infused with that which he will give you as you seek him, that you can overcome those things. They're not going to present a problem that you can't cope with. If your spirit's willing and your flesh is weak, I guess that's the same for all of us, then watch and pray that you don't enter into those kind of trials in the which it's going to be so hard to do what's right. It does the same kind of thing. While he sought the Lord, all well. But look what happens in verse, I mean, still in chapter 26, verse 16. It came to pass, I'm sorry, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And the priests tried to stop him, 
They went in after him, 80 priests, valiant men. They withstood him. He wouldn't listen. Why wouldn't he listen? He's lost touch with God. It's obvious, isn't it? How, how could he possibly have imagined that he can break that order that God has put in place? A very strict order. He had to be born into the right family, the Levites and um, the priests. And he, he was king, appointed by God, but not to do that. And I think, and it must have seemed so hard after a long reign of good works and good government to think that, that for that mistake, uh, he lo- he, the leprosy appears on his head straight away. And he loses that role and is isolated and after two years he dies. And so I said, that's why I think probably Isaiah needed to get a reminder of the holiness of God. Because it does seem so hard, doesn't it? It does seem so hard after a long, good reign. Now there's such a clue um, in verse 5 and I think it's very significant to us. Verse 5. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions. A man who knew what was right, who was in touch with the Lord, and no doubt a terrifically good influence on this king. And while he sought the Lord, everything was good. God made him to prosper. Now, while Zechariah is around, um, and that sin of pride, that the most stupid, I think the most stupid sin of the lot. And there's not a man on this earth who has any control over anything. And the richest, most powerful, most cleverest man on earth, you know, look at Donald Trump. Thank God it didn't happen, but any minute, and you know, you, you might have a terrific empire, business empire, you might be politically very successful, running countries, and the doctor says, sorry, but the biopsy and the scan, I'm awfully sorry, but it's malignant, and you've got about six months, and actually the doctor thinks it's really six weeks, you know. You actually, to have, that's a bit of a piece of dust. The pride. And it, how, they couldn't get near you if you're close to God, because you've got a view of your maker and of your own frailty and uh, submission to one being so much greater. And you see, he, while he's in good company, he seeks God. Now can I say this? Um, if you want to... This, this is about love, this talk. God who made you, the God who loves you. But if you... If you want a life based on the pure love of God, mix with the right people. Mix with the right people. Um, What an example is in the book of Ruth. I want to go back to Ruth. Um, Just to give an emphasis to what I'm saying here. Because I think it's incredibly important. Um, Sorry, it's at the end of... I'll give you the page, I'm going to give you a sec. Page 302. Well, 301 is where, where I am, really. And uh, you remember, Ruth has gone. There's been a famine in Israel. They've gone to the land of the Moabites, and her two sons, she has a husband and two sons. The two sons marry local girls, Orpah and Ruth. The men die. They're, all, they're now three widows. And um, Ruth... And, um, Naomi says, look, you go look to Orpah and Ruth. Look, you girls go back to your families. You'll get husbands. You'll, re- you'll recover from this disaster. I'm going to go back to my, my country. And um, I'm in, in Ruth verse 14. They lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. She said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and to her gods. It's very significant, isn't it? Well, to go back to her people is not so bad, that's natural enough. But the problem is, she's gone back to her gods. That's the real problem. And um, 
You go too. You'll get, you know, you'll be able to rebuild your lives. Ruth, you go with them. You'll get a new husband. You can start again. You'll, re you'll, you'll recover from this time of mourning and sorrow. It'll, it'll all be okay. But what? But look at Ruth. And Ruth said, "Entreat me not to leave you, or to return from following after you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people." will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me and more also if aught but death part me and thee. She is determined to belong to and be with the people of God. And remember, she's one of the ancestors of David, isn't she? Remember, it's a lovely story actually, Ruth and uh, Naomi. But I'm, that's why I'm, I'm trying to make that point um, you know, if, you, if I want the pure love of God, I will get that, or at least it will be built up and maintained in genuine Christian fellowship. And it is vital. It's vital. And uh, all the more as the day advances, and I'm going now to Hebrews 10, and I want to go back to Isaiah 6 briefly in a moment, but in Hebrews 10... And I'm on page 1214, well, 1213, 1213, Hebrews 10. And um, how valuable real fellowship can be. Uh, verse 23. Uh, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And I like this, for he is faithful who promised. I've got to hold fast, but my dependence is on God. And I'm sure all of you have exactly the same sentiment, don't you? And I'm determined to follow Christ. And I'm sure you would say the same thing with me. I'm determined to follow Christ. But I'm so grateful that he is faithful who promised. My sheep, my sheep in my voice, they follow me. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. I'm quoting you know, from John 10. And, um, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. There's an there's a, um, iron sharpening iron, isn't there, in, in real fellowship. Well, you don't just say, how are you? I'm fine. You actually get down to business. You know? Oh, this, brother, I have a terrible need. Um... And uh, it, might, it could be of any kind, you know, spiritual, natural, family, health. Can we pray? And by the way, you're wrong about that. I'm very graciously going to tell you. There's a verse that would help you see that clearer. You know, that if you want the pure love of God, mix with the right people. It's what God has ordained. The church is meant to be alive and self-correcting like a body is. It is a body. That's what a body does, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm in, uh, yeah, I'm in Hebrews 10. Consider one another, verse 24, provoked to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see a day approaching. I'm astonished at how casual people are about getting to the meetings. It just it astonishes me. And, and, and the way that, uh, you know, and unless you're blind, the way that the world is going and the, the things that are developing that are a sign of the times, and they're not very comfortable times at that, that and to think that, that we are all the more, it is all the more necessary to strengthen one another's hands and to be together in Christ and to be together, literally. The importance of it. But then the preceding verses, I love the way that, you know, the Hebrews is a fantastic book, isn't it? Well, all the books are fantastic. But um, verse 17, here's an encouraging verse. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Thank God. Now, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus... 
by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What a sign of the love of God. The, the system that he has put in place for our deliverance from the law of sin and death, from the burden of guilt that is massive. Very few people know how terrible sin is. Very, very few. But whether they know it or not, it is so. And it affects them fatally, whether they know it or not. And to think that God has put in place this mechanism where we can get right up close to him with him having forgotten our sins and in and through that wonderful high priest, Christ Jesus. There's so much in Hebrews about that. It's worth studying the book of Hebrews just for that. You know, the difference between the earthly priests who are all flawed and, and they died and their sins took them as well. But then the difference when we have our high priest perfect, sinless, in God's presence for us, even now, night and day, lifting up our souls before God and uh, taking all kinds of steps I don't think we will even know, and most of them till we get there. If we even will then, I don't know, all kinds of steps to minister life and love to us. So going back to the, the verse, coming close to the God who loves you. And um, I'm just going to read my text first. <clears throat> the Song of Solomon 7, verse 10. I am my beloved, and his desire is toward me. God who made you is the God who loves you. Thank you.